So first of all, um, I know everybody's just back from lunch and you're tired and stuff, so I'm not going to take a 20 minute presentation talking about big data. I'm going to keep it shorter. And uh, I'll give you some insights of what we believe big data is, how it can help achieve some of the SDGs. And I'll give you an example of a really, really innovative way of using data to solve some of the SDGs. Um, so, so as Malcolm said, my name is Joseph Thompson, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called ATEC. Um, when we created ATEC in 2015, we thought of RegTech, FinTech, LegalTech. We said, why not create a new company for a new industry? Uh, that's why we created ATEC. And we based our business model and we based our technology specifically aligned with the SDGs. So you could just say the SDGs essentially created ATEC. Um, and what we use is we use blockchain technology. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm not going to take any questions. We don't have time. But feel free to email me or catch me outside. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so before I start, as I mentioned, why we created ATEC and, and our role, I'm just going to give you a background on ourselves. I'm actually um, one of the UN SDG pioneers uh, this year. Thank you. <laughs> um, sp thank you. Um, specifically for blockchain technology, and it was in, we were announced at the General Assembly. So you can see at the highest levels that they are taking innovation technology very, very seriously. And we recently just won um, Cities Game Changer of the Year Award for Fighting Corruption using big data, and got the award from Christine Lagarde at the IMF. Um, again, it's bragging rights, but what it basically means is there's a massive industry out there. I personally believe that the SDGs is a new trillion dollar industry, and with that is going to come massive opportunities and massive amounts of data. So I'm going to talk through some of the, the pros and the cons, and I'm going to finish on a really innovative project that's using big data to solve uh, some problems. So what is big data? Big data is an umbrella term. It's usually digital data. Um, once you hear big data, you're going to hear things such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Um, big data is basically, some people call it the new oil. Uh, I think it's a massive opportunity. And I'm going to be slightly critical of aid organizations and NGOs as well. Sorry, but at least I'll evoke some debate. And the way we look at digital data is you're going to have millions of people that need services and products over the next 12 or 13 years. Um, and big data has to play a part in that. If you like it or not, um, I think data analytics teams are going to be hugely, hugely important going forward to try and solve some of the problems, to be proactive instead of reactive to situations happening around the world and to solve some of these SDG scenarios. So why harness big data for the SDGs? So more data has been created in the last two years than ever before, which is incredible. Um, and I suppose you can see the theme over the last even yesterday was 2.5 tr trillion dollars is needed to help achieve the SDGs. So as governments become tighter with money, uh, and aid organizations and NGOs look at different ways to generate revenue, I also think this is a massive opportunity for aid organizations to solve some of these problems. There's definitely a greater demand for transparency. We can see that absolutely everywhere. Um, my personal experience, I ran an event in 2009 in the Sahara Desert called the Marathon de Sabla. I raised $122,000. I donated it to a charity in the UK, uh, and the money went missing. So I became a skeptic, uh, and I stopped actually don giving any donations. So by using technology such as blockchains, there's a way for aid organizations and NGOs to generate more revenue and have the data that they are the trusted custodians on at the end. Um, but also when it comes to big data, there's, there's a lot of privacy and concern issues. Who owns the data? Who should get access to it? When should it be accessed, and so on? Um, a particular point is we were the first company in the world to deliver international aid to 500 Syrian refugees on the border with Syria and Lebanon two years ago. And the way we built out the platform was in the worst case scenario. So we said if we give a Syrian refugee a digital identity, what happens if that digital identity is lost? And we based it upon the scenario of Assad's regime or ISIS got this person's identity, this person would be dead. So how can the person manage their own data and how can they only receive certain products and services and topics uh, using blockchain technology? So, Every time you talk about big data, you're going to come across these issues. So it's almost to have a plan of how you're going to deal with them up front. Um, so new sources of data. So by 2020, there's going to be 6.1 billion, billion uh, smartphones worldwide. So there's going to be exponential growth in technology like blockchain, AI, and ML, and machine learning. And previously undocumented and under, underserved people will need to be accounted for. So 
kind of the SDG that we cling on to is SDG 16.9, that everybody should have a legal identity by 2030. But if we take a step back and critically look at this, since 2015, that means there's 166 million people that don't have a legal identity if they want to hit that 1.1 billion figure by 2030. Now, the way I view it is aid organizations and NGOs should be run almost, look at the most successful companies in the world. So your Facebooks, your Googles, your Amazons. What are they? They're data logistics companies. Whichever way you want to butter it up, they basically make a huge killing out of all the data. Um, but I think the opportunity here is we're working very close with UNDP in a couple of projects in, in Serbia where we're bringing remittances down by about 600%. We're working with UNDP in Jordan, where we're going to run the largest welfare delivery project from 10,000 Jordanian citizens, getting to 400,000 Jordanian citizens next year. But at the end of the day, it's, it's UNDP, the, our colleagues who are doing a phenomenal job, that will own and manage that data. Now, going back to a Facebook or a Google or Amazon, these guys are the kings of managing data. So I think if UNDP is rolling out services to 10,000 Jordanian citizens or 100,000 Jordanian citizens, the data that they have, the, the analytics that they can use in that data is, is, is absolutely ma massively powerful, which for-profit organizations would kill to have. So I think as projects are rolled out, as projects are scaled to solve some of the SDGs and so on, there needs to be that core implementation of how we manage this data, how do we safeguard it for them beneficiary, and what does that mean that we can take this to scale? Um, so you know, could a, a, an NGO use the data of transactions to go to a, a large corporate and say, well, we have more data on end beneficiaries who are unbanked. We know their buying habits. We're going to keep their data safe, their end beneficiary details safe. But we have the data that you want. So there's massive ways to look at different ways of generating revenue for, for organizations. And I think they could leverage some of these newer technologies. Um, so some of the data on the developing world. So you have this thing called the three Vs, potentially the four Vs. So variety, volume, and velocity. So I'm not going to go into them all in detail here, but basically, You've, you're going to have problems. So you have different variety of data. You have different data sets. So for example, um, we run a project with 8,000 women in Ireland who are either homeless or from the traveling community. So I don't know if anybody here has seen a movie with Brad Pitt called Snatch. So in that movie, the traveling community, uh, the men drink quite a lot. A particular project in Ireland is you couldn't give the women the cash because the men would take the cash and spend it on alcohol. So what the particular charity that we work with, St. Vincent de Paul, did they actually gave these women, women a digital identity, and they topped up the identity. The after effects of the data showed that there was more children went to school because the women were able to buy uniforms instead of the money being taken to spend on alcohol. And we didn't envision this. We didn't measure this impact at all. But it was just some brilliant ways of how data could be used. What that meant for this charity, the local supermarkets they worked with, they got a better deal in actually selling uniforms because they knew what the money was being spent on. And then. But that's not the same in every charity because there's going to be different data sets and so on. So there has to be ways that you can manage different data sets and how they can actually come together. So this is, I'm going to finish on this slide, so I'm going to keep it short. This is a project run by the Federation of the Red Cross um, that we're working with. And it's called Finance Based Forecasting. And it's quite brilliant. Um, and basically what it is, it's a blockchain smart contract. I'm sure everybody here has heard of blockchain. Um, it's an education piece, so I'm not even going to attempt to answer that now. And then you've heard of probably smart contracts. Smart, smart contracts are sets of conditions, and it's, it's human input, so an event is triggered. So what the Red Cross developed and we developed on the back end, and the Red Cross, uh, sorry, the IFRC won um, an award at the Government Awards last year in Dubai for this. They said, okay, if we take an example of Bangladesh or Peru, well, you know at a certain time of year disasters are going to hit, so flooding's going to hit, hurricanes are going to come, and so on. So what if we can do is equip people with a digital identity, and that digital identity is not just an identity, it also acts as a blockchain wallet address. Okay, so think of your iPhone. Nobody buys $1,000 for an iPhone just to make phone calls. You use it for productivity, social media, and so on. Now, a person's identity can receive aid, welfare, uh, donations, whatever it is. But the Red Cross knows a certain amount of people are in a certain low-lying land that's going to be hit by flooding. So you can't stop the flooding, you can't stop the hurricane. There's nothing you can do with that. But you can use the big data to say, okay, we know this is going to hit in the next 12 hours. If precipitation, if rain falls above a certain amount of millimeters, we can trigger a smart contract that tops up everybody, sorry, tops up everybody 30 or 40, 50 dollars to go and buy sandbags or rice in their local stores. Quite brilliant. So they're being proactive instead of reactive. And we know at climate change, 70% of the money is actually spent after the disaster happens. Now, the question we always get asked is, what happened to that hurricane 
changes direction and goes to the north of the island instead of the south of the islands. Okay, that's, all, that's fine. At least we know that we can actually redirect the actual top-ups of people's identity to the people north of the islands. So that gives us time to get ahead before the disaster hits where these end beneficiaries can buy these products and services. So all that big data is, is massively powerful. Uh, and we're working closely with the Irish Red Cross. And this is something fascinating from the Irish Red Cross. The Irish Red Cross got a big donation from Irish Aid for refugees in Greece. Uh, and what they did was they went down and bought bottles of water and um, blankets. When the refugees arrived in Greece from Syria, they weren't taking the bottles of water and blankets. And the Red Cross said, we spent $200,000 here. What the refugees actually wanted in this particular case was hair removal cream and toothbrushes, toothpaste, deodorant. So if the Red Cross had known they could actually use this, had this data, they actually could have bought different products and services from the Unilevers and the big corporates to actually deliver those services and products on time. So they are, that's just an example of how big data can be used to service international aid. Um, the final project that we're doing in Serbia is we're bringing, uh, using the blockchain to bring remittances down. So for example, if somebody in Serbia has a, a digital identity on the blockchain, um, and somebody in Germany can actually send them $50. Now, but it's not cash, it's determining how they can spend their money. So they're topping up their identity to spend on electricity or gas. Now, what that means for the government, it's a very easy sell for UNDP. They say to the government, you have the diaspora re-engaging, and you have control of the flow of funds of the $5 billion that's coming back in. It's not going into the gray market. We're bringing down transaction fees and so on. So the government of Serbia are actually looking at how can we use this for universal basic income? How do we use this for, for uh, health delivery for a pregnant mother trying to get health services for her, her, her newborn child? So it's going to be different in different jurisdictions, but I do think implementing uh, procedures and processes on the ground to manage the data and to use the data for predictive analysis going forward is going to be massive. I think it's opportunities to generate billions of dollars for these organizations who are only at the SDGs. And um, yeah, this is only one of the ways. There's lots of companies doing great work out there. Um, but I'm, my time's almost up, but I'm happy to answer any questions outside, not here. Uh, so um, my email is there, joseph at a.technology, or you can just um, ping me a message on the app and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. Thank you.